Uh, that's me. That's the slides. I talk fast. Let's have some fun. Uh, if I move, is that going to throw you off? Yeah, it, it is. OK, I'll try not to move. I tend to get weird. Oh, I can get weird? All right. Uh, so uh, that's a picture of me. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, I, I, uh, I used to work at a horrible place in Chicago. Uh, anybody worked in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? Friends? Yeah, don't. It's a horrible place. Uh, but I worked there for a while uh, as a low latency, as Java code, right? Low latency, high throughput, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I worked at Red Hat for a few years as an architect. But like the biggest thing I've been doing for a while is um, uh, helping organizations learn. Uh, seems kind of weird, but let's talk about how that works. This is the frame I want you to think about. Like I'm at DevOps days, you all know Deming, right? That's just, you have to to get in here, right? <laughs> uh, this is what I want you all to think about while we're jamming today. A lot of places I go, they all want the answer. <laughs> What's the answer? How do we just become the, how do we become the new Netflix or how do we become Etsy? Just give us the answer. Tell us what to do. There is no shortcut, right? If, if you just want the answer, if you just want the magic potion, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. If you find it, by all means, like patent it because you'll make a million dollars. But it doesn't exist. And so you actually have to want to get better. And you have to be intentional about it. And you have to uh, learn along the way. You have to invest in learning. Right? So this is, what we'll, this is what we'll talk about today. Uh, how do we go about creating spaces where learning is what happens? For me, these are the things uh, that I see in organizations that need to happen uh, to learn. And I'll, I'll give you some kind of context here in a little bit about what these all mean. Uh, but it, you, look, you can read them all, right? Uh, to, to learn, you have to be able to experiment. And, and implicit in there uh, is to be able to experiment, it has to be safe to experiment, right? <laughs> Everybody says, we're a learning organization, just never be wrong. <laughs> that is not going to be a good way to learn. Right? So it has to be safe. It has to be implied that like, it's OK to, to, to try some things out, and we're going to be wrong. I, I had a dear friend of mine that said, because uh, you know, learning and failing is a, is a popular thing. right? And a, a dear friend of mine used to say, uh, the only difference between learning and failure was cost. <laughs> when it was cheap, everybody's like, oh, we learned. It was great. But if it was expensive, people were like, that was a failure. So we have to make things cheap. We have to make it easy to, to, to fail and learn. It has to be something we're always doing. It has to be contextual. It has to be experience-based. So let's get into this a little bit more. Uh, why, why does learning have to be repetitive? Why do we have to do things consistently? Anybody know what this is besides the Wikipedia link <laughs> down here? <laughs> yes, it's the forgetting curve. Good, good job. Um, there was this dude back in like the eight, late 1800s, uh, Herman Ebbinghaus, who came up with this theory, uh, which is pretty obvious, right? Uh, if you're trying to learn something new, if you don't repeat it, you forget it. <laughs> Mind blown, right? But that was the 1800s, and we we're smarter now. Uh, but this is the thing to think about, right? So like if you learn something here you know, in day zero, if you're, if you're not trying it and doing it over and over again, the, you know, by day six, you tend to forget these things. If you do it again the next day, it, it lasts a little bit longer. If you do it again, it lasts a little bit longer. You see where this is kind of going? Uh, this is where I think it makes sense to me is, uh, so I, I, look, I teach courses and stuff. I taught uh, TDD, uh, I teach DevOps courses, and I am wonderful at it. <laughs> But the point being is that if you hang out with me for a couple days and we do some things, then you don't do it when you go back to work, and you don't do it the next day, and then you're busy because the project's due, and then something else happens, it doesn't matter how awesome the course was. I guarantee you, when you go and try and do it, you won't know how to do it, because you have to do these things over and over again. Then you have this kind of fun thing. Uh, I mentioned the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It looked like this was being recorded, so I have no problem saying that they're a horrible place a second time. Uh, at the Mercantile Exchange, we were a learning organization because you got 40 hours a year to learn. Therefore, we're invested in your learning. But you know how that goes. That just means you can't do anything until December 15th, and then you have to use it by the end of the year. Otherwise, you lose it. You're all smart people. Statistically speaking, if you have 40 hours distributed over the course of a year, you're not learning. <laughs> you're just doing what you always do. And the learning is an anomaly. And so. If you want to have a culture where learning is a thing that happens, learning can't be an anomaly. 
It has to be just something that's ingrained in what you do. It has to be continuously happening. Everybody know this fine gentleman? Anybody? Have, oh, I, I don't know him either. Um, <laughs> it'd be really weird if you're like, yeah, that's so, so and so. Uh, anybody have an idea what this gentleman's doing? He's selling things on water. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably what he's really doing, but for my analogy, he's transferring knowledge, right? Because not, that's what knowledge is, right? I can just pour it into a cup and say, here you go. Now you have the knowledge. And this is, what, this is the language we use in organizations as we talk about knowledge transfer, knowledge transfer, knowledge transfer. The reality is, like, for us to actually learn things, we, people can't just pour it into a cup and say, now you have it. it does, that's not, we have to create, knowledge creation is a personal thing. You have to do it yourself for it to happen. You can't just drink it, and now you have it. So again, I'm trying to give you ideas of how these things have to come together for you. And last but not least, one of my favorite ones. Uh, any guesses what that fabulous picture is? There you go, it's a tattoo. Uh, and it's even my tattoos. And so here's the background on this story. I was talking to my tattoo artist uh, a few years ago, and uh, I go, so how, how did you get into tattooing? I, you know, seems like a fair question. I go, I, hopefully you weren't just like an artist, and one day you said, I'm really good at drawing. <laughs> Give me some body parts, and I'm going to figure this stuff out. And he says, no, that would be silly. Don't, don't do that. And so he, he went through the whole process of how he had to learn to tattoo. You know, he had to learn how to draw, but then he had to practice on other, on other like, non-body parts. He had to practice on various fruits and these kinds of things. He had to observe people. But in essence, he had to experience it himself. Now, I think about that, and like, this, like to me, this is a very creative process, just like all the things you do. It's a creative process. He has to understand how di various different skins will age and inks will age and how different colors will look. But I think about the organizations we're in, and like, we think if we send a couple people to AWS training, that when they come back, they can put it into Jira, or not Jira. <laughs> they can put it into Confluence or SharePoint, and now everybody has it. Because somebody went to a class and they put it in SharePoint. But if you try and do it, it's like, well, just go read it. That's not how it works. If you go to get a tattoo and you ask the artist how they learned and they say, well, I learned from SharePoint, don't get that tattoo. <laughs> it's not going to be good. Right? But so for, for in your space, we can't just do these things where like a couple people from our team went to the class. Now everybody knows. It doesn't work that way. You have to experience these things yourselves. If SharePoint and, uh, uh, and Confluence were like solving the world's problems with knowledge transfers and, and sharing information, everybody would be crushing it. No one is. <laughs> or I shouldn't say no one, but it's not that, that common. So given these challenges, kind of like what are the things that a lot of people are doing that I don't think work so good, um, they copy. <laughs> because again, we want the shortcut. Well, what does Spotify do? Well, they have tribes. Let's have tribes then. And then we'll be smart and we'll be productive like, like them. What does Netflix do? Well, they do chaos engineering, so let's do that, and now we'll be successful. You can't copy your way to success. The, uh, one of the, I forget the gentleman's name, uh, it wasn't Taiichi Ono, it was uh, one of the other gentlemen from the Toyota days, was saying things like, uh, we'll tell you the way Toyota does everything. That's fine. If that helps you, good. But you'll never know what we learned to get there, and that's what makes us better. You can't copy Spotify and copy Netflix and all of a sudden be better because you're not going to have the context that they had. You're not going to have the learnings that they had to get there. So we can't copy our way to success. And this one's even more fun. Anybody in here? If I offend anybody, my apologies. Anybody in here doing maturity models or like want to do maturity models? Or you know, the consultants come in and say, you know, tell me how mature we are on a level of one to five. This kind of stuff happens all the time. Here's what I find interesting about this. It's always by somebody at a high level that says, come in and grade my teams and tell me where the gaps are. The fun part is that your teams, the people doing things, already know what the problems are. But instead of just talking to the people that are actually doing the work, we want some outside group to come in and say, give me a score. Just talk to your people and make it so that they can learn and they can get better. Enough ranting, <laughs> I promise. Well, a little more ranting, uh, and then uh, we'll talk about how these things kind of work. Transformations aren't, look, uh, this is very cut and dried. It should be pretty obvious. This idea 
Uh, who in here is doing a transformation, whether it's a DevOps or a product or some kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, you have to look. If you're not doing a transformation, you've already lost, right? Um, look, uh, we're all from, well, most of us uh, remember the Transformers, right? Like, like there was Optimus Prime, and he was a truck, and then he transformed, and he was a robot, and it was kind of you know game over, right? Organization, like if, you're, if your goal in your organization is that you're going to transform and then you're done, it, it's kind of silly. You, your goal shouldn't be to be done. Your goal should be to always get better. So if the idea is just transform, I think you got the wrong approach on it. So it's, it's, look, embrace learning, always be there, always looking how to get better, and let's get into how you can go about doing it. Coming back to these, these kind of main concepts, right, repetition, uh, repetition, experimentation, always learning, make it learning a, a, a part of what you do, context and experience. I'm going to walk you through the stuff that, that, that we've been doing with uh, organizations. And look, look here, uh, I know the, the dude that introduced me said I'm a consultant, I'm an independent consultant. I'm also a horrible salesperson. Uh, I'm not here to sell you anything, so just so you're on the same page. Look, uh, you're all certified in whatever I say, go off and be merry. The stuff that, that I've been finding successful for a lot of groups is this idea of these, these dojos. And so this came up from Gene Kim's DevOps handbook early, uh, early on. He talks about the three ways. He was talking about examples of organizations doing this stuff. I just happened to be at one of those organizations consulting, kind of helping them figure out how to create a learning organization. And so we do these dojo stuff. So uh, you can read it all, but like this is what it is. You create this, this space where whole teams come together, right, mind blown already, uh, and they come together to learn new ideas while doing their work. It's as simple as that. Uh, the whole team, so it's not just the operations people figuring out Chef or Puppet or whatever is you know, hip these days. Uh, it's not just the designers figuring out how to do wireframes. It's not just the scrum masters figuring out scrum or whatever they do there. Uh, and it's not just the engineers learning microservices, it's the whole group learning new things together to build their product. They learn things, they apply it immediately, they figure out how it works for them, how it doesn't work, where it falls apart, but they do these things together. And so it f kind of fits into this sweet spot, right? So like, they're, they're there doing real stuff, it's not sandbox where nothing goes wrong, you still have to deal with security and policies and, and everything else that's gonna go wrong in your real world, they're doing that while learning new things, guided by people, uh, but they're continuously building upon it. And early on, it's slow and it's painful, but then teams start to get this, this, this flow where they're learning new things and they figure out how the new things fit into their daily work and they figure out um, how, to, how to work together better. And then the things that they're investing in, these new skills are there and they continuously build upon them. And so it's this kind of, uh, nice, nice contextual value for them. It's experience-based. People aren't doing it for them. So it's just an, a nice space to get into. This, this is just to give you an idea, and it'll make more sense in the, in the next uh, slide. Um, in a lot of places, you know, this is, uh, t take aside uh, DevOps and all these other kinds of things, you're all here together uh, to make sure this kind of stuff happens, right? People are happy. So at some point in time, somebody identifies people are unhappy, and we gotta do things along the way to make people happy, make people's lives better. And there's just a, a flow of how those problems get solved. That's all I'm trying to show you in this slide. Now, if you think about these four kind of groupings, there's various skills that might happen along the way, but like the idea that you know, your only problem <laughs> is over here uh, is, is usually not true, right? Uh, I've built products for years. Usually what happens is, and this is not picking anybody again, I'm not here to offend anybody. Um, usually what happens is somebody has an idea. It's not really a good idea, it's not been vetted, but I got a good idea and I got budget, so let's go ahead and figure out how to, how to, how to make sure we build it. Let's build it, and then once it's in production and it's not doing the things we want to do, let's keep on cramming more things this way and then let's call it technical debt over here, but it's because the ideas weren't good, and the ideas aren't vetted. And I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to pick on anybody here, but this is why we need everybody together, is that all of these things impact each other. And so, when I lay that out, I think about these kinds of things. So this is the same slide, just kind of <laughs> not as pretty, right? 
Like if you were to think, like I've worked with a ton of groups that want to do monitoring. Everybody wants to do monitoring. Let, let's do monitoring. And so everybody does like, is the, is the process up? Yeah, I guess that's cool. Like if you need systems to be up, but like you could do so much more. Like you could actually, if you're building microservices and you were like trying to build out a new product, you could figure out how it's gonna help people and you could actually do domain driven design instead of talking about it. And you could actually come up with good bounded contexts around your services and you could do it in a test driven manner and have really simple small things and then the monitoring could actually help you figure out if your services are being used the way they think they're gonna be used. And that's way cooler than figuring out if the CPU is 100% or not. And so this is how you get people together and you, you, you ground them together on this kind of outcome. This is the, this is the, this is the thing we wanna do. How do we learn together to do it? And this stuff doesn't stop, right? Like you gotta learn how to do it for a little while, but like the idea of learning when your, uh, your product is done never ends. So you gotta learn some skills along the way, but all these things tie together. And if you start doing them well as a group, everything becomes easier. And now it's not about, you know, how do we cram <laughs> more features through because Jira said we have to cram more features through, otherwise the velocity is too low. It's about what are we learning along the way and how does it feed back into other aspects of things? And that's more cool. And then people get jazzed and excited. Uh, excuse me. So like what are some things that these groups do uh, uh, in these dojos? This is just two totally different examples for you. One is a team doing brand new product development. One is a team doing cloud migration stuff. It, you probably can't even read any of those words, at least I can't and I'm that close. But what I want you to think about up here is, uh, this is over the course of six weeks, teams are learning lots of things and they're continuously building upon it. They're not just learning how do I build a service and then how do I deploy it, they're learning how do I figure out uh, what, the, what the problem is, how do I do a little bit of API design, how do I build a pipeline, how do I do test driven, how do I do monitoring in context, how do I do it over and over and over and over again. So teams get this very, like, small, they get this very small focus on learning a little thing at a time and then continuously building upon it, doing it over and over again, expanding upon it, solving bigger problems. And it's just been a very f rich environment for this, uh, for these types of uh, groups. That's from the team perspective. So teams are learning things and that's good. There's people there to help teams. But what's nice is once you start to get this environment going and like teams are learning things, I like to have density of teams. I like to have, like if I'm in a space, I'm not gonna just work with one team and go over there and then go work over there and go work over there. I want the teams coming together. And then what starts happening is teams start helping each other because like a team, a lot of your teams are gonna have similar challenges. And so if you've had a team that's already uh, got past the first hurdle and they see the next team coming in to hit it, they can start helping that team. And now they're teaching while they're help, uh, helping our teams. Now you have this organic learning happening inside your organization. And that's a beautiful thing. And so now all of a sudden it's not like how do we create communities of practice, it's just that people naturally start to orient together around similar problems. When I was at the Mercantile Exchange in Chicago, again a horrible place, <laughs> we, we had, we had a, a, a uh, center of excellence, right? Because you have to have a center of excellence. Um, and we were, I was in that uh, uh, as, a, as an architect, and it was uh, me and a couple of architects just kind of hypothesizing? No, what's the word? Hy hypothesizing. Hy that one, hypothesizing about what everybody else should do. And so we just kind of came up with all these, for everybody to be excellent, we should all do these things. But no one would do them because we weren't helping each other. It was just kind of like coming down from decree. But like when we started creating these environments and teams were helping each other, it just became the way that they worked. They were always helping each other. Learning became this given. It was the thing that everybody was talking about. How do we help each other? And it was just a nice, rich environment. Prior to a bunch of these organizations starting these things, they weren't very nice to each other, right? So like this was actually like a, 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 a significant change for a lot of groups. And then this whole idea that, is my mouse still over there? I can't even find it. All right, we'll worry about that. When teams start learning things, the organization starts learning things, right? And so just as I'm sure you've all experienced, um, a lot of challenges that teams have aren't the team's problem, <laughs> right? And so like in one organization I had, I was working with the, these engineers and uh, uh, I'm working with a front end engineer and we're doing some, some uh, angular testing together. <laughs> 
teach them how to do Angular, this kind of stuff. And the, the middleware engineer comes up and he goes, oh, okay, the, the service is ready to be tested. And he's looking at me. And he goes, the service is ready to be tested. I go, that's cool. He's sitting right here. Why don't you talk to this dude and why don't you work together on it together? In this organization, those two people, the, the front end engineer and the middleware engineer, worked on the same product, were not allowed to see each other's code base. And so when I was talking to security, I go, you realize the one dude could just go like this. And your whole security windows, your whole security policy is out the window, right? But they would never do that because that's a violation of blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, dude, like, like this is just, this is not a real problem. This is something you created, <laughs> right? If you think that's funny, they, they, they gave me a policy number, and I had never heard of it before. And it turned out, and I started looking it up, and the only way I could find this policy ever referred to as like a best security practice was in their job postings for their company. And it turned out the company created it, but the security company didn't, the security guy didn't know that they created it, so he didn't know he could change it. That was fun. <laughs> so again, what's going to happen is as teams start learning things, all of the organizational stuff's going to blow up. When you slow down to learn things, all of the other constraints are going to get magnified. Like when we, we tell teams to kind of slow down and, and, and kind of figure out what's happening, you start to hit these things where people are like, but we just have to do it faster. Okay, that, what happens if we do it faster? Everybody, everybody tells you there's a deadline. It's fun to say, uh, so if the deadline is October 1st, ask somebody what's the cost on October 2nd? If they don't know the cost, this is where it gets fun. If they don't know the cost on October 2nd, say, well, give me an order of magnitude. Is it $1, $1,000, or a $1 million? If they don't know the order of magnitude of the cost on the next day, their dates are not real. <laughs> 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 and so that's where it gets fun, right? But again, once you slow down to help teams learn and you focus on doing things well and getting context, all the organizational things start to blow up. All those. If there's bad ideas, this is something called, a little practice called Delta Next, where you start validating assumptions. But a lot of organizations have these biases that just says, if we do things faster, we're going to be successful. Turns out that's not the case. Turns out the problem a lot of organizations isn't speed, right? We can do things faster. Turns out the problem is a lot of times we don't know what we're doing. And so you're going to reveal these biases. And again, this isn't a team problem. But like, if you slow down to learn, you can ask better questions. And all of a sudden, this becomes this, this feedback uh, into doing better things across an organization. Last couple things for you here to think about. So hopefully you're jazzed about the idea of learning. You, you at least get an idea quickly around how this dojo works and kind of benefits of it. I, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> if you're trying to teach a group uh, uh, to learn, it's different than trying to teach a team a process. And so uh, you, we're all friends here. <laughs> Uh, a lot of places I go, so free, again, I'm not here to offend anybody. Feel free to throw anything at me that you want. Um, but a lot of places I go, they have like scrum masters or coaches or those kinds of things. And a lot of times what happens is those people aren't there for learning. They're there for the process. Why didn't you put that in JIRA? There's no points on that. There has to be points. Why, you know, <laughs> this, this thing's too big. Why are things carrying over? Just realize that when you're trying to coach for learning, it's drastically different than coaching for a process. You have to uh, help teams. Uh, you have to help teams think through what's happening inside their head versus just kind of telling them to to, to not question authority. The the things I think about in this space. If you're trying to help teams learn, it can't be philosophical. Well, you know, if you wrote a test, that would be good, and then walk away. Turns out you have to be able to do things. <laughs> when I'm working with teams, uh, I'm working with teams. Like, we're sitting down as a group, and we're learning things together. It's not philosophical, like, oh, that's hard to write that test because the code's bad. Why don't you go refactor it? I'm going to walk away for a couple hours. No, it's like, we got to do these things, and we've got to get through it together. So it's not philosophical. There's no meta thinking here. It's doing. You have to be able to do. <laughs> And if you're trying to coach for learning, it's not about giving the answer. It's about helping people answer the questions. The thing I tell a lot of groups is um, make it safe for the group, obviously, to kind of fail, but know the, know the cost of their failure, right? Like if a team's trying to learn something and you don't think it's the right answer, if it's uh, 
risky for them, either politically or financially or something else, to go down that road, don't let them go down that road. But if it's not, let them go. There's been plenty of times where I've been wrong, where I was like, oh, they shouldn't do that. And sure enough, they did it, and it was a better idea. That's cool. There's been plenty of times where I was actually right, because it's good to be right occasionally. Um, but if I just give you the answer and you don't experience it, it doesn't matter. Like you, you don't know why it's that way, right? Uh, and so just realize if you want to create this space of learning, you need to, you need to recognize where a group is at, create learning opportunities for them that are safe, right? Make it safe for, make it safe for learning, be that kind of guardrail for them so they don't you know, blow up, but allow them to, to kind of figure it out on their own. I can't even see what's going on here in my slides. Uh, so you want to start on your starting your learning journey, starting up your space. The easiest thing to do. Uh, this is why I tell every group, regardless if you're doing this dojo stuff or not. If you're trying to create a learning space, you can't just say we're going to learn to learn. You have to uh, uh, put some kind of uh, structure around your learning. Like, why are we going to learn these things? What's it going to help us do? It might sound silly. But the reason why you have to talk about where you're going to focus and what the impact is going to have is because if you try and focus on learning, at some point in time, somebody above your pay grade is going to say, prove to me that learning was a good idea. Sounds ridiculous if it's happened everywhere I've gone for the past seven years. When we don't talk about why we're focusing on what we're focusing on, then when somebody asks that question, we give very bad answers. Well, it's a good investment because we've talked to five teams. It's like, but if you come in and say, look, uh, a lot of our teams are struggling because they're having lots of, uh, uh, their, their, their builds are failing in production, so we wanted to slow down so we could stabilize some of the testing and invest in testing and invest in better pipelines. And then when they come back and say, prove to me that learning those things was a good idea, you can say, look, the teams that we've helped aren't having this kind of uh, failure demand. They're actually spending more time building good ideas. Well, assuming they're good ideas. But if you don't think about where you're going to focus, you're going to have bad answers. And then last but not least, think about this kind of space. If you know what you want to focus on, just realize that you know, it's the whole theory of constraints, right? If you want to get better, uh, if you want to get better uh, products out the door, you're not going to get it. But if the, if the constraint is the ideas being vetted, spending time learning more operational stuff isn't going to make it better, right? If the, if the problem is uh, your environments are always unstable, maybe you shouldn't worry about more pipelines. Maybe you should actually have some tests, right? That's a fun one. Everybody wants a pipeline, but nobody wants tests. Just build it. Oh, well. But use this idea, once you have an idea of the, the focus you want to have and the impact you want to have, to figure out what skills will have that impact for you. Teach those skills, guide those teams, Figure out if it's helping, and you'll, you'll learn in the context of something that's going to help your organization. Yeah, uh, <laughs> don't skimp on the coaching. My only takeaway for this is, like, if you're going to learn, you need somebody to help the teams learn. Fair enough. Um, I'll tell you this. Uh, your best architect and your best engineer might not be the best person to teach. Just, just based upon pure experience. A lot of engineers, uh, present company excluded, um, they, they just, they, you know, they want to give the answer. They want, they, 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 they're not sure about how to kind of guide the, guide the experience. And so that's what I want you to think about is if you want people to help your teams learn, just make sure that you pick people that have those kind of like nurturing skills and, and it's not just the answer or I'm going to be upset with you. It's like, let's walk through this. Let's pause. They have to be, they have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And, walking teams through these things. So I think I'm good on time, right? Yeah. Look, uh, even, even if the rest of my stuff was nonsense, my, 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 uh, my ask of you all is just this, you know, in your organizations, embrace learning. Make it just kind of the things you do. Think about the language you even use. Like when I'm working with teams, we, uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about, you know, the, the ideas we're trying to do. Like the, I have teams and we talk about outcomes, 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 right? And then we'll talk about uh, while we're getting to these outcomes, what are the things we want to learn along the way? And, we, so we're, and then when we're, we're like, look, 
again, you feel free to throw stuff at me, uh, but like we'll do stand-ups kind of in the morning we'll, and we'll talk about things. But like the worst thing you can do is say, what did you do yesterday? What are you gonna do today? What's gonna get in your way? Well, yesterday I had too many meetings. The only thing getting in the way of me getting stuff done is more meetings today. It's not interesting. Change your language. And so like when we do these, these stamps with these groups, it's as a group, we talk about where are we trying to get? What did we learn getting there yesterday? And based upon what we've discovered, what has changed? And that's not about you being fast and you being slow. It's about us and the realization that we're going to learn things as we build things. And so we have to embrace that idea of learning. Use that language. Even if you're not learning new skills, you're always learning something. It turns out when you wrote the code and deployed it, it didn't work the way I thought it did. It turned out MongoDB did things kind of crazy. Talk about what you're learning. Use that language to, to embrace your learning. Always experiment, always evolve. Uh, kind of, it, it, you're not going to transform. <laughs> you're like you're not going to be a robot tomorrow. Uh, but use these things to figure out ways that you can learn and continuously evolve. The last kind of thing for you to think about, again, feels right because we're it's the DevOps stuff, right? So we're deming. You, you all have wonderful organizations, and you're all brilliant people. Just allow your people to, to do the things they need to do. You don't need to hire outside people with maturity models to tell you, like, turns out you should actually have a pipeline, or you should write a test, or turns out you might want to vet some ideas. You all know this stuff. Slow down and talk about it uh, and make learning part of what you do. There's this nice thing that somebody was uh, put on uh, Twitter back in January or February about like, you know, January and February, everybody wants to hire the rock stars because we're gonna hire the best, right? <laughs> it's like, well, it turns out everybody's trying to hire the best. Why don't you just make your people better, <laughs> right? <laughs> As opposed to always trying to hire the best. That's way easier than trying to compete with everybody in the world for two people, right? So invest in your people, it, it, take learning the next step, make it what you do. There's some, some stuff up there for you if you're, if you're, if you're bored or interested. Uh, I did this talk with my partner a, a few years back with IT Revolution, um, talking about how these things work. Um, yeah, so if you want to check that out, it was pretty fun. I actually wrote a book. Uh, this is not even, this is more or less for my mom. I wrote a book so my mom could say, my son wrote a book. So I expect none of you to buy it, <laughs> right? Uh, but a lot of things around making learning organizations is, is covered in the book and the stuff I've mentioned here. Uh, there you go. What questions do you all have? Yeah, what do you got, dude? Yeah, so how do you make it safe to fail? Um, it, it's a good question. It, there, there's always going to be different ways to do things, right? So like uh, when we're doing these things, um, there's a couple of simple, there's a couple like structural things that I always do for groups, right? So like the first thing is before a team's coming in to learn with me, I'm sitting down with their management, kind of going through expectations, saying like, look, and I, look, I'm super explicit. I say the first two or three weeks, expect 50% of your normal capacity to be delivered. And I say, you gotta give space. If you can't give space, kind of just kind of back off. Um, so, and then I'm continuing conversations with management, blah, 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 that kind of fun stuff. Inside, uh, inside when, when we're learning together, we'll do like super short, uh, kind of focused, if you call them sprints, right? We do, we do stuff in two days. And it's not two days because two days is cooler. It's because uh, a lot of times teams will get wrapped up in all the things they could do. And instead, it's like they, they get wrapped up and they want to debate everything because they don't want to be wrong. And so I, it's, instead, it's like, well, let's just try something for a day or two and then come back and revisit it. So it's kind of like these short focus things help out a lot. And then uh, uh, another thing I've had to do, uh, it's easy for me to do because I'm the outside guy. I've been in places, I had this one group, this VP of engineering. So the team was down here learning with me and they had been with me for a week and a half. And the, the VP comes in, and this is, this is wild. The VP comes in and the team's showing what they've built. And the VP goes, why isn't this done yet? And I go, it's nice to meet you too. Uh, and he, go, and he, go, he go starts railing into the team. You know, this should be done by now, blah, 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 blah. And you can see the whole team just kind of like, oh man. And I'm like, well, you know, the team learned a lot of things. They've fixed a lot of systemic problems. I don't care about that, it should be done by now. And then he goes, I could have finished it in two days. And I go, and so you see the team's kind of like, oh man. And I go, <laughs> I go, uh, I go, uh, I go, that's awesome, dude. I go, come down tomorrow and let's knock it out, me and you. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, we all heard you say it would take two days. You're wasting everybody's time and money. Come down and let's do it. 
uh, and so, of course, then he kind of has to back off. That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. So I, all I'm trying to tell you with that story is that, like, at some point in time, you've got to stand up to those kinds of things where it's just nonsense. So, like, the, there is no easy answer. I, like, the, the short things for teams to focus tends to help a little bit. Setting expectations early on helps a little bit. But, like, when people are assholes, you've got to say, stop being an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more time? Or are we good? Do we have a couple minutes? Any more questions? I don't know if I'm out of time or not. Uh, questions? What else you got? What do you got, dude? Sorry, I'm trying to not be so blind. So you, you worked at that place that you hate a lot. They said you worked, uh, <laughs> you, you had 40 hours a, a, a year, so I assume they gave you a week to learn some stuff. Say you wanted to do like one day, and it's probably not feasible. Say every, every week you had one day to just learn something. Yeah. Um, or, or maybe it's just that 40-hour week. What do you do at the end of that to make sure that whoever is supposed to be learning isn't on Facebook or Twitter or whatever and doing nothing of value to the company uh, without so making them feel like an idiot because maybe they just spun their wheels the whole time. But, yeah. but to pitch it to management, how do you say, like, all right, they've been working on learning some stuff. Here's something concrete that you can do with it and it's actually valuable. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So if I, if, I, if I hear your question correctly, the question is, like, so if people get some time to learn, uh, how do we prove that they're not kind of looking at cat videos? Yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it's a totally fair question, dude. Uh, so in, in, in my experience, that's always the question that gets asked. And the, the more common pattern isn't that people are watching YouTube videos. It's, the, it's that they're going to be doing their other work or doing kind of maintenance stuff instead of learning stuff. And so that's, that's the harder part is how do you actually get them to release it and actually do things? I've, I've never, you know, it's, I, I guess my point is I don't have a good answer to say that they're not looking on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, but usually they're not learning because something else is happening. And so then we have to talk about kind of what's happening systemically that's not allowing them to learn. I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what do you got? Oh, over here. Sorry. <laughs> that was a trick. The premise here is that people are self-motivated to learn. I'm finding that there are certain people that are very happy and feel better about just doing what we've always done, no matter if we give them better tools, better ways of doing things. Don't do that. Just it's broken. It's fine. We'll deal with it in the morning. Um, this is a dilemma that I'm struggling with. Are there people out there that just are not interested in learning, no matter what kind of environment or time or incentive you give them? Yeah, so the, so the question, oh, you all heard that. She's got a microphone on in your reprint. I would totally agree with you. I think there's, there's usually people that are comfortable not learning. Um, when I've worked with groups, if there's people like that, I, look, I, I personally don't push on it. Usually what's happening, though, uh, it's usually not a whole team. It's usually a couple people inside of a team. Um, and so then what's happening is there's always a reason behind that, right? So like <laughs> at this horrible place that I worked at in Chicago, uh, <laughs> There, there was this, this gentleman uh, that never wanted to work with anybody, never wanted to talk to anybody, didn't want to learn anything, just kind of leave him alone and he'll write code all day. Turned out he was a spy for China. That's besides the point. Um, which, which was pretty wild. Uh, um, but like, the only thing we can do is kind of show the team getting better than if they don't want to be part of the team, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I, I've... I've it sounds harsh, but like it's usually better to kind of cut the cut the people that don't want to be part as opposed to like, you know, supporting it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the cool thing for me, like when I'm working with these teams, uh, I'm a very uh, like I won't I won't push the person to learn, but I will sit next to you for a while, <laughs> right? And I'll be like, hey, I know you want to learn some things. Let's sit down and do some stuff together. But like if after a while if they're just not into it, I'm not going to force the situation. If it becomes a detriment to the group, then we'll talk about it. But like. There's only so much you can do. One more, or we got to go? One more. Larry, you got it. What's up? So coming from the opposite angle, say you're super motiv motivated, you love learning, you want to go to trainings, you want coaches. Yeah, yeah. How do you convince your managers or your people that are looking at the bottom line that it's worth the investment for them to give you these opportunities? Like the investment in learning in general? Or like the well, investment? I mean, trainings yeah. and coaches, it, it costs money. It costs, so. yeah, it costs a lot of money. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. so how do you, 
how do you convince them of the return on investment? In that, that? That's why I come back to that idea of like where you want to focus. And so like, if I'm going to talk about learning, it's never uh, learning for learning's sake. Don't get me wrong, that's cool. But like ultimately, if we want to learn something, it's in the context of it's going to help us do something better organizationally. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with like Don Reinerson's and like the economics of flow and those kind of books, but he'll talk about like business impact. If we can tie back learning into like a business impact, uh, then, it, then everything becomes like, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, the whole idea like around continuous integration and continuous delivery to me is about experimenting faster in your products. And so if people are saying, turns out our markets are slow, it, we're, we're slow to the market, well, it, it, let's learn how to make it so we can experiment better in these markets. And so it's not so much just about the learning aspect, it's about if we got better at these things, could we do this? On the flip side of that, like what, it, what I'll talk with a lot of groups about is, um, a lot of organizations are already spending a ridiculous amount of money on learning and getting no, no return on their investment. Because usually what happens, and again, maybe you're all different, uh, in a lot of places what happens is they'll send a lot of people out, never a team, it's always two from you and two from there and two from there and over the course of a year, everybody gets to go. Uh, so they're already spending a lot of money, but they don't realize they're not getting any return on that. And so I'll just say, instead of doing, like, you know, let's do one team and have them learn something together while they're actually building their product, and let's compare those two models together. That's been more effective, too. Yeah. Cool. I think it's lunchtime. Right? Joel Tassi. All right. There he is. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.